It was a warm July evening in Pennsylvania, the kind of evening that seemed perfect for a rally. The crowd had gathered, the energy was high, and former President Donald Trump stood before his supporters, rallying them as he had done so many times before. But lurking nearby, hidden on the roof of a building just within shooting range, was Thomas Matthew Crooks, a 20-year-old nursing home aide armed with a rifle he had borrowed from his father. For 90 minutes, Crooks remained undetected, waiting, watching, and preparing to strike. When some rallygoers reported seeing a man on the rooftop, law enforcement was slow to respond, leaving the Secret Service and local police scrambling to address the threat. The acting director of the Secret Service, Ronald Rowe Jr., later expressed his outrage, saying, What I saw made me ashamed. I cannot defend why that roof was not better secured. This glaring security lapse, one of the worst in decades, nearly cost Donald Trump his life. Millimeters separated life from death that night, as the shots fired by crooks wounded Trump and killed another man, while two others were injured. The more investigators dig into what happened that evening, the more missed opportunities they uncover. The Secret Service's refusal to deploy a surveillance drone, the failure to detect crooks' own drone until it was too late, and the lack of communication between local law enforcement and Secret Service agents. The security perimeter left the building vulnerable, allowing crooks to climb onto the roof and evade detection for far too long. But beyond the security failures, one question continues to haunt everyone involved. Why did Thomas Matthew Crooks attempt to kill the former president? What drove this young man with no prior criminal record to such a violent act? It's a question that months later remains unanswered as the public and investigators alike try to piece together the motive behind this assassination attempt. In these turbulent political times with tensions high and another attempt on Trump's life in Florida, the answers seem more elusive than ever. This account, based on extensive reviews of documents, text messages and video footage, paints a chilling picture of a night that could have changed history, but leaves more questions than it answers. How did one man, armed with little more than a borrowed rifle and a drone, outmaneuver one of the most well-trained security forces in the world? And what does this failure mean for the safety of our leaders moving forward? As the investigations continue, one thing is certain. The system meant to protect the nation's highest office is far more fragile than we ever imagined. Rose sat under the harsh glare of the bright lights, his lips pressed into a thin, tense line, and his voice thick with barely concealed anger as senators took turns laying into him and his agents. They demanded answers, demanding to know how someone had managed to get on top of a nearby roof during a rally and fire off eight rounds, grazing Trump's ear, injuring three others and killing one. The frustration in the room was palpable as Roe's voice grew louder at the Senate hearing on July 30, where he faced off against lawmakers calling for heads to roll. Someone, anyone, who had been on the ground that day. They weren't satisfied with the fact that the agency's chief, Kim Cheadle, had already resigned a week earlier. But Roe ever the bulldog dug in. I will not rush to judgment, he snapped at one senator. People will be held accountable and I will do so with integrity. His words echoed through the chamber, a mixture of defiance and determination. He wasn't pointing the finger at anyone specific, but there was a thinly veiled jab at the Pennsylvania police officers who had been tasked with guarding the building complex from where the shots were fired. Yet he wasn't trying to minimize the colossal failure that day either. Acknowledging that it took far too long for local officers to realize that Crooks wasn't just an oddball with a backpack. Local police, in turn, threw some blame back at the Secret Service, citing communications breakdowns that began when the face-to-face -face meeting the Secret Service had promised before the event never happened. The breakdown in coordination between the Secret Service and local law enforcement had been catastrophic. Since the 1940s, Secret Service agents have been equipped with cutting-edge technology allowing them to communicate in real time. Even back when ordinary citizens had to find a phone booth, these agents were already talking into their sleeves and wearing wired earpieces. Yet on this fateful day when a man standing outside the perimeter of metal detectors and Secret Service scrutiny raised alarms, there was no effective way for local police to relay the imminent danger directly to the agents closest to Trump or to the federal snipers stationed on nearby rooftops. The moments ticked by and by the time the threat was fully understood, it was already too late to hustle Trump off the stage or take down the gunman. Just last week, the Secret Service released a five-page document summarizing its preliminary conclusions in a report that's still being finalized. The findings were damning, 
the agency failed to provide clear guidance to local law enforcement at the rally, failed to resolve line-of-sight issues that left Trump vulnerable to sniper fire, and some agents on duty that day were described as complacent. Meanwhile, a bipartisan report from the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, made public on Wednesday, was even more direct, calling the Secret Service's failures in planning, communication, security, and resource allocation for the July 13 Butler rally foreseeable, preventable, and directly related to the events that led to the assassination attempt that day. The blame, it seemed, was spread across both federal and local authorities. The unguarded roof, the missed signals, and the lack of coordination had created the perfect storm for a tragedy that almost claimed a former president's life. It was meant to be a typical Trump rally, set outdoors at the Butler Farm showgrounds, surrounded by the iconic red barns and wide-open fields of western Pennsylvania. Butler County, known for its strong Trump support, had always been a bastion for the former president, with voter turnout at around 80 percent and Trump clinching about 66 percent of the vote in both 2016 and 2020. The rural landscape, however, had one significant drawback. Poor cell service. That would later play a key role in hampering police communications when they needed it most. The Secret Service hadn't deployed any systems to boost signals leaving both local police and federal agents vulnerable to the impending crisis. Three days after the rally was announced, a 20-year-old nursing home aide named Thomas Matthew Crooks registered to attend. Crooks, from Bethel Park, just south of Pittsburgh, had also been scouring the internet, including searching for, how far away was Oswald from Kennedy? Oswald, as the world knows, assassinated President John F. Kennedy from a concealed position on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, 265.3 feet from his target. But Crooks planned to fire from double that distance. Armed with an AR-style weapon borrowed from his father, a gun that fired faster and with greater ease than anything Oswald had, Crooks began preparing. On July 7 he made the 45-minute trip to the Butler Farm showgrounds and spent about 20 minutes there, scoping out the area. The FBI would later say he was casing the venue. A day before the rally, Crooks practiced shooting at a local sports club. Then, on July 13, the day of the rally, he returned to the farm grounds and stayed for over an hour before heading home. At 1.30 p.m., Crooks' father handed him the rifle, believing his son was headed back to the club to continue practicing. But 25 minutes later, Crooks was purchasing 50 rounds of ammunition. He parked his car at a gas station lot a third of a mile away from the rally, dressed in camouflage shorts a black belt and a gray t-shirt emblazoned with the logo of a YouTube channel dedicated to firearms. He rode a bicycle to the rally grounds, carrying a large backpack filled with his gear. The next part of his plan was underway. FBI investigators have since cracked into Crook's phone, scoured his laptop, and interviewed hundreds of people trying to piece together his motive. Yet as of now the answer remains elusive. Those who knew Crooks have painted a picture of a quiet, smart, but socially withdrawn young man. Classmates from Bethel Park High School described him as someone who often kept to himself, usually seen with headphones on, sitting alone at lunch, his eyes glued to his phone. Some recalled he was frequently mocked for his choice of clothing, which often included hunting gear, and for continuing to wear a mask long after the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic had passed. He sat by himself, didn't talk to anyone, didn't even try to make conversation, said Liam Campbell, a former classmate. He was an odd kid but nothing about him seemed dangerous. Just a normal person who seemed like he didn't like talking to people. After graduating in 2022, Crooks enrolled at the Community College of Allegheny County, where he graduated with honors this past May, earning an associate's degree in engineering science. He also worked as a dietary aide at a nursing home. According to state records, Crooks had been registered as a Republican, yet in January 2021, there was a $15 donation recorded under his name to a progressive group. It was one of many contradictions in a young man who would soon come to the attention of the world for reasons no one saw coming. There were about 155 law enforcement officers at the rally that day, including a Secret Service counter-sniper team, a Butler County SWAT team and uniformed officers. Hundreds of Trump supporters had gathered, eager to hear him speak. Among them, moving quietly through the crowd and the surrounding area, was Thomas Matthew Crooks. After arriving at the Butler Farm showgrounds on that sunny Saturday afternoon, Crooks flew a drone for approximately 11 minutes, 
using the controller to get a direct view of the rally area. The Secret Service didn't activate its drone detection system until much later in the afternoon, missing this critical early moment. Requests from the advance team which had scouted the venue beforehand for additional technology to be deployed were denied, leaving gaping vulnerabilities. The first sighting of crooks came at 4.26 p.m., more than an hour and a half before Trump was scheduled to speak. A Beaver County sniper stationed at the event spotted Crook sitting alone at a picnic table and thought his behavior looked suspicious. He texted his fellow snipers stationed inside the nearby AGR building complex. He knows you guys are up there. He's sitting to the direct right on a picnic table about 50 yards from the exit. At 5.38 p.m., Another Beaver County sniper stationed inside the building where Crooks would later fire from the roof sent photos of Crooks to the local sniper team's group chat. I did see him with a rangefinder looking towards the stage. If you want to notify SS snipers to look out. I lost sight of him. He also noted the presence of a bike and a backpack nearby that hadn't been there earlier. Despite this, Secret Service sniper teams, positioned on the roof closest to where Trump was set to speak, were never informed. At 5.45 p.m., a local sniper recommended notifying the command post, where team leaders were stationed about crooks. There were two command posts on site, but the Secret Service was only present at one. They're asking for a direction of travel, one local sniper relayed. Not sure. Beaver County SWAT sniper Gregory Nickel responded at 6 p.m., just 11 minutes before crooks would open fire. He was up against the building. I had to guess toward the back. Away from the event. Nickel later told ABC News, I assumed that there would be somebody coming out to, you know, to speak with this individual or, you know, find out what's going on. The AGR complex, a maze of buildings, allowed Crooks to make his way to the roof of the structure closest to the rally site. Nickel had been attempting to follow him from within the building but eventually lost sight of him. Footage from that day shows Crooks walking back to his car, which was parked near where other local snipers were stationed. Inside that car were improvised explosive devices, though no one knew this at the time. Shortly after, bystanders spotted Crooks again, this time as he pulled himself up to the roof. They even captured him on their mobile phones as he slithered into position, rifle in hand. They called the police. In those critical moments, it seemed as though security had been crowdsourced. The authorities either hadn't noticed the threat or hadn't treated it with the urgency it deserved. By 6.08 p.m., Law enforcement had their eyes back on crooks. A Secret Service countersniper saw local officers running toward the building, guns drawn, but he didn't alert Trump's protective detail. The rally continued. Three minutes later, a local officer was hoisted up onto the roof by a colleague and spotted crooks with the rifle, lying in position and aiming his weapon. He's armed, the officer radioed to his squad. He's got a long gun. That message, too, didn't make it to the right Secret Service officials. Thirty seconds later, Crooks fired his shots. Days after the shooting, Trump took to the stage at the Republican National Convention and spent over ten minutes recounting in vivid detail what had happened to him on that warm, beautiful day in the early evening in Butler Township, in the Great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The crowd was captivated. Some of Trump's supporters even went as far as to wear ear bandages in solidarity, mimicking the injury he had sustained that day. Even some of Trump's most vocal critics acknowledged that his performance in Butler had been a masterstroke, raising his fist, blood trickling down his face and mouthing fight as he was hustled away from the stage. During his convention speech Trump claimed, the assassin's bullet came within a quarter of an inch of taking my life. It was, by all accounts, not much of an exaggeration. The bullet had grazed his ear and his escape from death had been close, too close. At the start of his speech, Trump seemed to be speaking to more than just his loyal MAGA base, trying for once to reach a wider audience. The discord and division in our society must be healed, he said, we must heal it quickly. But that sentiment was short-lived. He soon shifted back to his familiar rhetoric. The bombast, the hyperbole, the depictions of a nation decaying under democratic leadership. The heat in the political arena has not cooled since. Following another assassination attempt at a golf course, Trump and his allies have doubled down, blaming Democratic rhetoric for making him a literal target. In that incident, no shots were fired. The suspect never had Trump in his line of sight and fled after a Secret Service agent fired at him. The man was later captured. 
By comparison, the golf course episode was a better handled security operation than Butler, but the Secret Service is once again facing tough questions. The man had been able to remain undetected on Trump's property for nearly 12 hours, lying in wait with a rifle, scope, video camera, and food. In the wake of the Butler shooting, investigators have conducted over 1,000 interviews and fielded more than 2,000 tips. They've searched Crook's home, accessed his phone, and sent the explosives found in his car for testing. Yet, despite all this, no motive has been identified, no co-conspirators have been found, and the FBI admits to a general absence of other information to date. Deputy FBI Director Paul Abate acknowledged the frustrating lack of answers. Crook's behavior hadn't set off any alarms at first. The Secret Service only heard about a suspicious person that local authorities were concerned about. The counter-sniper who saw officers running with guns drawn didn't think to alert Trump's detail to pull him from the stage. The crucial words, threat or gun, came only in the final seconds but by then it was too late. There was no unified radio frequency that all the multi-agency officers could use to communicate. Local officers had to radio the Joint Command Center, and the Secret Service then relayed those messages to Trump's detail, a process too slow in a life-or-death situation. Jason Woods, team leader of Beaver County's Emergency Services Unit and SWAT Sniper Section, later revealed to ABC News that his team had no direct contact with the Secret Service agents guarding Trump. We were supposed to get a face-to-face -face briefing with the Secret Service members when they arrived, and that never happened, Woods said. So I think that was probably a pivotal point where I started thinking things were wrong because it never happened. We had no communication, not until after the shooting. The Senate committee report, though still preliminary, makes no effort to soften the blow. It bluntly lays out the massive failures within the Secret Service that day. And as law enforcement uncovers more details, congressional inquiries are expected to intensify, especially in the politically charged atmosphere of a presidential campaign. During his testimony, Ronald Rowe, the acting Secret Service chief, hinted that local officers might also bear some responsibility for the catastrophic failure. Controlling high ground is something that's a must for us whenever we go into a location, Rowe said. We made an assumption that local teams were covering the AGR building. He paused for a moment and added, if they had just held their post and looked left, his voice trailed off. Maybe. But Rowe didn't dwell on the point. Later, at a press conference, he made his position clear. This was a Secret Service failure. The security failures at the July 13 Trump rally in Pennsylvania read like a tragic checklist of errors and missteps. What should have been a routine rally turned into a near catastrophe when a man on a nearby rooftop fired eight shots in an attempt to kill Trump, leaving one man dead, two seriously injured, and Trump with a wound to his ear. Here's what went wrong that day. Local police had expected a Secret Service briefing before the event, but it never happened. Worse yet, they had also anticipated constant communication with federal agents, but one local official admitted that there was no direct contact with the Secret Service until after the shooting. Acting Secret Service Director Ronald Rowe acknowledged a critical error. The agency had assumed that local snipers were covering the high ground, specifically the AGR building where Thomas Matthew Crooks eventually took his position. It was a fatal assumption. Rowe testified that controlling high ground is a must but the failure to do so left Trump exposed. At around 4 p.m. on the day of the rally, Crooks flew a drone over the grounds for 11 minutes, live-streaming the flight as he surveyed the area. The Secret Service, which has the technology to detect unauthorized drones and pinpoint their operators, failed to activate their detection system until about an hour later. Had the system been operational earlier, Crooks might have been caught and questioned before he could carry out his plan. To make matters worse, the Secret Service declined an offer from local police to use their surveillance drone for the event. Rowe later admitted to Congress, we probably should have taken them up on it. Then there was the issue of the roof. That roof line should have been covered, Rowe testified. Everyone in hindsight agreed. Crooks had easy access to the squat roof of the AGR building, yet the local sniper teams were posted inside the building, not on top of it. This oversight gave Crooks a clear shot from double the distance that Lee Harvey Oswald had when he killed President John F. Kennedy in 1963. And with a modern AR-style rifle, Crooks had more than enough firepower. The timeline of the shooting is critical. Trump took the stage at 6.05 p.m. By 6.08 p.m., 
local officers had spotted crooks on the roof. By 6.11 p.m., one officer had risen above the roof line, seen crooks with the rifle, and radioed that the gunman had a long gun. That message was sent to the Joint Command Center, but as Roe later testified, none of that information ever made it over our net. Secret Service agents stationed closest to Trump never received the message in time to act. Communication failures plagued the entire operation. The Secret Service didn't bring mobile satellite units to boost signal strength in an area with notoriously bad cell service. And to make matters worse, the Secret Service and local police were on different radio frequencies. This communication gap meant that urgent messages from local officers had to go through the command center before being relayed to Trump's detail, a process that proved too slow. The most urgent message of all that there was a man with a gun on the roof wasn't received until crooks had already opened fire. Adding to the confusion was the nature of spotting suspicious persons. Local police noticed several individuals acting oddly throughout the day, but that's not unusual at large events. Many people who draw police attention turn out to be harmless. Crooks first caught the attention of local officers at 4.16 p.m., and they took his photo almost an hour later. As their concern grew, they alerted someone within the Secret Service about the suspicious person, but that communication came just 25 minutes before the shooting, and it lacked critical details like the words, threat, or gun. Words that might have escalated the situation sooner. Typically, the Secret Service partners with local law enforcement to secure events when a president or high-level official visits. Local police aren't paid for this work and it often stretches their resources thin. The Secret Service sent an advance team to the Butler rally five days prior, and they set up barriers, blocked roads and moved vehicles as a standard. But what's supposed to be constant coordination between the federal and local forces was undermined by a series of small lapses that ultimately added up to a significant failure. In the end, the shooting at the Butler rally revealed systemic weaknesses in coordination and communication between federal and local law enforcement. Assumptions were made, technology went and used, and communication channels broke down, leading to a series of preventable errors that nearly resulted in the assassination of a former president. The Senate inquiry promises to dig deeper, but the initial findings are already clear. This was a failure of epic proportions. 